thanks again for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to be here. I see a couple of names in the chat that I recognize, and thank you, Professor Yako, for, for calling me here to have a chat. Um, I, I visited NWU, uh, you know, like he said, a couple of years ago. It was a great pleasure. And at that time, I, I spoke a bit about uh, what open educational resources were in general. And I tried to give a, a, a general overview of our perspective on, on open educational resources. So this, in a sense, it's, it's a separate talk, but it's also a talk that kind of advances that first discussion for, for those of you that happen to either see it or, or were there when, when uh, we visited. The idea of discussing this topic is related to uh, thinking about OER and open educational resources beyond just the, the general concept of what, what do they constitute in themselves? What is, what is the essence of an OER? And generally, we reduce uh, the OER um, idea to thinking about licenses. And that's incredibly important. Um, if, you've, if you've never dealt with OER before, if this is your first time, uh, open educational resources are educational resources of any kind, you know, videos and audios and courses and syllabi and whatever materials you use in education that at least have some sort of open licenses or, or, or license or in the public domain. And if you've ever come across a resource with a Creative Commons license or any other type of uh, open license in a software, like a GPL license, an MIT license, those are the kind of things that we're basically talking about, that are resources that allow you to do certain things that give you some freedoms uh, and those have become really important uh, over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. This has become a very strong global movement, and it's uh, a pillar of the ODS-7, of the, of the sustainable, sorry, ODS in Portuguese, Sustainable Development Goals for UNESCO number four. Uh, so it's you know, promoting education for all open educational resources are seen as a very important part of this goal. So in 2019, UNESCO had uh, ratified a recommendation that's called the uh, UNESCO OER recommendation, which doesn't come by very often. It was a, a very important moment uh, where 193 countries, if I'm not mistaken, ratified unanimously uh, the importance of open educational resources to reach uh, uh, the goal of, of education for all. So this is a really important topic. A lot of times when, when we talk about OER, people see it as a kind of a fringe movement of some scholars, some academics or activists that are interested in OER, but it has grown to become really a very important part of how we think about uh, inclusive education and education for all. But, and that's the important part here, is, is that we have very different conceptions of what OER mean and what OER can do. Uh, in general, we all agree open educational resources should have an open license and allow people to have some freedoms. And that's basic. Beyond that, it takes on different flavors. And that doesn't lead to necessarily to disagreements, but to how, how we all believe uh, OER can really benefit us. And these perspectives are very different from different corners of the world, depending on the priorities that we have. And what I'd like to present to you is a perspective which I think is uh, very much related to our experience here in South America, but also because of, of this, this connection that we've had with South Africa for a little while now. Uh, I, we see very similar issues that I think are important to, to both our, our, our corners of the world. And I'll let you judge that. One of them is this idea of open source tools uh, or free and open source software. But before I get to that, I'll take about 10 minutes in the beginning uh, or 15 minutes to talk about why we think this is important. And then I'll go on to which will be more like a show and tell and give you a bunch of ideas of, of the kinds of things that we, we have been using and that you can use to create uh, open educational resources based on these principles of openness. So let me let me share my screen quickly and try to give you a, a quick perspective on on why we think this this whole idea is important. And let me see if I can also share video at the same time. And if this fails, as it, I think it did, uh, well, I'll just share the screen then. I'll keep going with that. Um, so one of the big reasons we, we deal with this idea of open educational resources and open uh, source tools is that because we, we live in a scenario now, particularly around the idea of the pandemic or the existence of the pandemic, where we are moving our educational system to uh, the cloud. Uh, this has become a phenomenon not only here in South America, but around the world. And I was just reading a paper, uh, rereading a paper that I read a while back from Michael Quet, where he talks about South Africa, and I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to say this correctly, but Operation uh, Fakisa in education. Uh, and, and he's already talking about this in 2014, if I believe, uh, of some of these phenomena that are happening in, in South Africa. 
And these are very similar, in a sense, to, to what's happening around the world, where we're moving our educational systems, administration, teaching to on the online environment. And that, for, for those of us interested in open education and open education resources, is a, is a very interesting thing, because we can leverage a lot of what we do in terms of open education through the use uh, of, of online systems and the internet and so forth. But this poses also a challenge. And this challenge can be symbolized by this acronym, which is called GAFUM, or Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, which you might have seen before. And I won't be able to talk about this thoroughly, which I would do in another moment, but I just wanted to present to you why we think that using openness uh, right now is more important than ever, considering the scenario that we're living in. Uh, the, a lot of educational systems around the world, and we've, we've mapped this, and we'll be launching actually this afternoon a mapping that we've done of all countries in South America, uh, where we show that uh, the majority of you know, higher education institutions, public higher education institutions in the continent uh, host uh, solutions, educational solutions, with at least two companies, which are Google and Microsoft. And this phenomenon has been incredibly fast and it has, has been taking uh, a, a sort of a, a totality of the educational system where a lot of institutions and educational systems at the state and municipal level have migrated a lot of the basic services, including what we do in teaching and learning and sharing resources and creating resources to proprietary private corporations. Why is this a problem? Uh, the problem is, and this is under the banner of, uh, of some terms like uh, 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 <clears throat> capital, um, sorry, uh, data colonialism uh, and uh, capitalism and vigilance and uh, other terminology that's used around this is that this idea that we are mostly giving up control of the systems that we use for teaching, learning, and administration of our educational systems. And this is a problem because of an, a number of ideas, and I'd just like to, to present some of these to you uh, so that we can think about why it's important to think beyond just the idea of free to think about open in terms of the tools that we use as well when we're talking about open education. So the first thing that we know is that uh, it's very difficult to map this territory, to understand what happens when we move uh, our systems to Google and Microsoft and these other companies. Contracts are a lot of times unavailable. A lot of information that we want to know about how these things are done are secret. Uh, the case of South Africa in, that I was mentioning earlier that the, in the article points to that very clearly. There are sometimes uh, gag orders where people can't talk about what's happening in these projects. We really don't know what happens to our data when we migrate to these services uh, from these big corporations that are private corporations. We know for sure, and we've known for quite a while, that these free services that we get, so in the form of, of uh, video conferencing and, and data uh, uh, management and analysis and you know the, the sharing of our videos and hosting of our videos, these are very expensive, very, uh, and many times very good services that are very expensive to maintain, and they scale over time. I mean, they, they, there's just a lot of data that's collected that just increases over time, and it, it boggles the mind to think about how they could be offered for free to educational services. One of the first things we know that uh, acts as a way to counter that uh, and, and, and counter the argument of free is that a lot of this is, is collected and analyzed. Data and metadata is collected and analyzed by these companies. Data from our students, from our faculty, from staff, these data are millions and millions and billions of point of data over time that are collected and analyzed to, to find information and predict information and to understand patterns of behavior. This feeds into algorithms and leads to things like we've we've seen very often uh, uh, these these problems related to things like fake news. So uh, a lot of this data goes into feeding massive algorithms that makes decisions and present us with data and personalized learning in, in some cases uh, that uh, sustain these companies. So. Uh, in a sense, we're trading a lot of what is supposed to be free for giving up information that feeds algorithms and leads to automatic analysis of, of, of the data that's coming in. And these are massive amounts of data. Imagine your know, kids at, as, as young as eight years old when they get joined school or seven years old or six years old in some cases, they create an account with one of these businesses and they spend the rest of their school life uh, creating a profile. The amount of data that you collect and, and, and the metadata, the, the data about data, where you are, who you're talking to, all this data uh, becomes a massive amount of, of information that can feed algorithms to do this automatically. 
And this has led to a lot of problems. We've seen, you know, people in the beginning talked about fake news as a, as a kind of a, a comic thing. It wasn't, it was funny to see fake news, but now we've seen the fake news is a real problem. Uh, and this has, this has a lot to do with our behavior in these platforms and how they feed these algorithms. Importantly for us, uh, platform loyalty is a big problem. Uh, once uh, school systems and educational systems join these these platforms, uh, kids get at a very young age, but but also teachers and students that are older, they join in these platforms, and it's very hard once you get in to get out. So once you 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 join in one of these systems, this loyalty that you build is is happens in in pretty much two ways. One of which is if you create like a Gmail account or a Google account of some sort, a lot of the systems that you use hover or depend on that uh, Gmail account to function. So your cell phone is connected to your Gmail account. Maybe your, your bank account, if you forget your password, is related to your Gmail account. And so all sorts of other services get connected to this. You host gigabytes and gigabytes of data or photos of email to the point where it's very difficult to leave. The other form of platform loyalty, and this was was said by a, a, a director of education for Google here in Brazil, is that you 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 provide loyalty from a very young age. So when people start using these platforms when they're very young, when they get to the labor market and when they go to work, they'll demand these same things. So if you use you know Windows today as your operating system, it might give you a clue as to why you do it. It's because it's pretty much most what most people know. You know we've built we've been building building loyalty around these systems like Office and Windows since we're a very young uh, very young age, and this is a marketing strategy. So free comes with these costs as well. Uh, when university systems uh, adhere to these uh, these uh, software, they also create uh, a, a sort of uh, uh, a lack of, of a possibility. So I'm, I'm calling here a service agnosticism. You know, people can't choose what they're going to use. So if a university like NWU, and, and I know NWU is an exception, but if a NWU or my university UNB has a contract with Microsoft, I'm kind of forcing everybody around me to use it, which is exactly what happens. And we don't have many options. You can't have six email services to use. You can't have four or five video conferencing systems. You pretty much have one that ends up being the one for everybody. And so you, you blank it out this to, to everybody and everybody ends up having to use this and no other alternative. We've seen, and I'll go very quickly towards these last three, uh, we've seen algorithm prejudice and content removal. So people use things like YouTube to put, post their content. You know, Think about where you as a teacher would post video content. You generally would do it at YouTube. And we've seen uh, ways in which the algorithm takes down content uh, based on some sort of prejudice that you nobody controls just because it was analyzed as a, as a problematic photo or a problematic video. And of course, content removal. I mean, these, these, YouTube is not a public utility, for example. Uh, Facebook is not a public utility. They are free to remove content as they wish and remove accounts as they wish. Uh, zero rating and net neutrality is a big problem for uh, especially poor countries. Zero rating is this idea that you, you find a contract, for example, with your cell phone company for, for uh, 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 data. You, know, you have like uh, four gigabytes of data you can use on your cell phone plan, for example. And once that's done, there are certain services that continue to function. And generally, these are related to these big businesses. So WhatsApp or Facebook continue to function even though you've reached your, your bandwidth limit. And that also leads to this idea of concentration of power. I mean, the more we use these services, the more we stick to these services, the more these businesses buy other small businesses, we end up being surrounded by these, these same businesses on everything that we do. And education has going, been going in the same direction around these five big companies. And in our neck of the woods, in our corner, Google and Microsoft are incredibly important. In other places, uh, these, uh, these might change, but they kind of hover around these five big businesses. So these are huge problems. And as, as open educators, this is a, a, a particularly important thing for us because we think that this bigger issue of digital rights is something that has been ignored. Um, it's not something that we really talk about too much. We tend to talk about uh, open educational resources and, 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 and focus on that as the big issue. But for us, there are about four, at least four pillars that are related to open education. And one of them involves in this bottom part here, digital rights. As I mentioned, open educational resources are important to us. Open licenses using open formats are important. And the idea of using free and open source software is another pillar. Together, these things make uh, open education make sense in the world that we live today, where we are in these massive platforms, where we are in these big businesses, we are running proprietary software. 
and we don't tend not to see the big picture around OER when we look at uh, an open education, when we look at it from the perspective of just looking at open licenses. So this opens up a little bit of a wider picture of what we mean by, by open education. First, as I mentioned, the idea of open licenses, but also importantly, the idea of open formats, of, of providing your resources and formats that are readable by other people, that are standardized and not proprietary by some of these corporations that we just talked about earlier. So like uh, you know, Microsoft own a bunch, uh, uh, owns a bunch of proprietary formats. And if you share that file in a format that other people can't read, it becomes very difficult for them to make use of that, of that software, of that product that you created. Free and open source software is a very important part of that. Uh, uh, free and open source software works around the idea of open formats. And so they're essentially a big part of, of thinking about how you create and how you share OER. Uh, very briefly, the idea of free and open source software taken from the uh, uh, Free Software Foundation has four basic pillars, is this idea that you should be able to have software where you can not only just run the program, but you can actually study how the program works and change it. That's essential to the idea of OER. The idea of, of open licenses and having open formats goes into the same vein, is the idea that you can not only get the thing for free, uh, you can see the video on YouTube, but you can actually download the video. You can play with it. You can see how it works. You can change it. You can modify it. Uh, you can distribute copies. So if you get a copy from somebody, you don't have to fear that you're you know, infringing somebody's rights by distributing that copy to somebody else. And finally, if you've changed it, if you remixed it, if you created a mashup, if you created a, a derivative of this, if you've used your creativity to enhance whatever you found online, you are free then to distribute this uh, to others in the future. These principles of free and open source software are very much related to what we talk about in, in open educational resources, but a lot of times we don't think about them. And they are very closely intertwined. It makes a lot of sense and it makes it far easier for us to create open educational resources if we use free and open source software because they inherently work around the idea of open formats. They, they only function if they're using open formats that people can inspect, change, see, use and anybody can download that software to, to see the program, the, the, the file that you created, whether it's a video that you created or an image or a text. The idea of free and open source software feeds into very nicely to the idea of open educational resources when we talk about open formats. And that in turn leads to the, the principle of open educational practice or OEP, which is if we as educators want to incorporate openness in our practice, if we want to use OER, if we want people to collaborate, if we want people to share and produce things that they uh, put online that others can use, if we want to be part of this big community of, of, of people that share and collaborate together, uh, it, these open educational practices must depend on OER and must depend on free and open source software. If I have to share a resource with you and say you have to buy this program in order to, to use it, I'm really not doing something openly. If I do uh, create a, 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 a something for you to use, and I say, well, now you have to pay for it, then I'm uh, to, to 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 use my 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 system. Or if I create a a, a a resource where I say, hey, you're free to remix it. I give you an open license to remix it, but you can't open the document. Then we're really not working in the in the principles of of open educational practices and and OER and so forth. So these things kind of come together. In the scenario that we're in right now, in the moment that we're living in, uh, we have to be very attentive to the sorts of software that we use, sort of platforms that we use, uh, and, and think about using alternatives and solutions that are much more aligned with the idea of free and open, and not just free in the sense of free beer, but free in the sense of freedom. And if we stick to, to platforms like those offered by these big you know, private corporations, we're kind of going against the principles of, of openness in the first place. So that's just to kind of set the tone of why we're talking about this. And it's not just because we like free and open source software and it's just uh, something fun to do. It, it's because it's inherent to the principle of open education and it's inherent to the moment that we live in today. We cannot keep concentrating education around private proprietary platforms that give us services for free and in, at the same time infringe uh, on our digital rights. And that's incredibly important as open educators. So in order to do that, what I wanted to do today is to share with you some ideas uh, about what we can do in terms of, of using these, uh, these resources of open source uh, and free software in creating OER. 
In order to do that, uh, we started uh, last year uh, a project called Free Choice, and it's available only in Portuguese. Unfortunately, we didn't have the funds to translate it to English, but it's it's kind of a guide uh, on uh, open source and free software and open educational resources for teachers. And uh, the site basically provides information, and you, you know you can use an automatic translator if you're so inclined. But <clears throat> it's a it's a site that provides information on how you can share resources. It has testimonies from you know teachers and educators talking about what, what you can do and where you can do things like share, create resources uh, using open educational resources and open source software. So what I'd like to do today is kind of give you some of the ideas that we unearthed and put together in this free choice guide by telling you about a bunch of, uh, I think, really interesting solutions that you can use to create open educational resources. And Yaku, can you please confirm that you can't see my video? I can't see it here, but I don't know if you can for some reason. Uh, Tell we can see your, your browser screen, but your own screen is, is uh, blank. Um, uh, so I don't see a video. Yeah, it doesn't allow me to share the, the video together. But <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll try to switch back and forth. Let me let me do that. Yes, I think that, that ought to work. Very quickly. All right. So we're back here. Very quickly, let me. All right, so I'll do this a little bit differently. So the first one I'd like to share with you, and I'll start with uh, uh, creating. You know, if you wanted to create things, what would you do if you wanted to, to create new resources? And the first thing I'll, I'll show you is uh, Audacity. And Audacity is a very powerful tool to create uh, uh, audio tracks. So a lot of people are really interested in using podcasts and using and creating uh, um, audio files for students for accessibility. But generally, people are really interested in creating things like podcasts. And what, I, what I'd like to do is to share very quickly just an idea of, of, of how this works. Uh, Audacity is like a, a multi-track uh, open source software that you can use, you can download, your students can download, and it allows you to create these little tracks uh, and work with tracks to create things like podcasts and let me let me see if I can just play this very quickly to show you what this would look like but if you've ever created something like uh, uh, a podcast or try to create it uh, in in uh, for students for class or something like this audacity will allow to do it very easily and the, the great thing about using an open source software like this, you can make it quite So it seems like we've lost your sound. Tell me there, I think you're muted. Sorry, I'm back. I was trying to to play this for you at the same time, but a Zoom has some small limitations. So let me let me just stick to the basics. You can hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll stop trying to do too many things and I'll do the simpler things. So uh, Audacity is a, is a very cool platform for you to create multi-track uh, audio. And it's, it's, it's one of these software for free and open source software that's kind of like the standard. It's not like if you wanted to talk to somebody about creating audio tracks, the recommendation I think from people that use proprietary software or use free software would be the same. Audacity is a great tool to start uh, if you want to, and, and even if you're really good at, at doing uh, audio editing, is a great tool for you to, uh, to, to develop things like podcasts and the like. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start putting some things in the chat and then I'll share with you the whole list. The second thing I'd like to share with you, which is uh, a lot of people are, are very much afraid of, of digging video editing. And one of the things that we've been asked to do, I think um, that's common for faculty almost everywhere, is to create videos. I mean, we, we record everything that we do, we put everything online. Some In some universities, that's mandatory. Uh, and a lot of times we, we don't uh, either take the time to to make them, you know, if it's something that we're going to use in the future, we don't take the time to edit a little bit and make it a little bit prettier or to, uh, if you're doing OER, you want to create the attribution correctly, maybe put a screen in the end where you say what kind of Creative Commons license your video has. OpenShot is one of those solutions that is uh, 
really quite easy for you to use because it, it's incredibly intuitive. It's, it provides you with a very simple interface to create uh, 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 videos and edit videos and multi-track in the same way that I was mentioning earlier. Let me share very quickly just an example. I wanted to put the audio together, but that will definitely not work now. So I'll just share with you a little interface here uh, of a little animation that we did. And you can see how you know it provides you with a little bit of a uh, a preview on the corner. It, it provides you with spaces to put you know, images and audio, and you can create, you know, uh, animations. You can create, you know, just edit video, add soundtracks, whatever you'd like to it. And it's incredibly intuitive to use. You know, it will be something like uh, somebody that has never used it before uh, will be able to 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 do it quite easily. So. OpenShot is, I think, a really great solution that's an open source solution. And uh, even though you might have some issues, one of the things that you can do is you can kind of get the whole project, like with Audacity, and give it to somebody, and somebody else can go on and edit it. So if you're working with you know, groups of students, they can collaborate on editing video um, with, this, with this software just by kind of sharing the whole package with each other. Uh, and, and that creates a kind of a collaborative environment. Uh, you can export it in all sorts of different ways and, and provide it in, in many formats. So OpenShot is a really really quite of a, a cool solution. Uh, many people have started streaming, right? And uh, <coughs> people have started doing a lot of streaming and they have a lot, started a lot of uh, you know, lecture recording. And this is another one that's kind of the standard, even though you can find proprietary solutions for this. OBS Studio has become kind of a standard for, for not only uh, creating your own lectures and, and things of the sort, but also if you want to stream to things like YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Streaming is a kind of a, an expensive proposition. And other than PeerTube, there, there are very few open solutions for streaming. But at least you can do on the back end is you can use something like an open source solution like OBS. And it's incredibly powerful. It allows you to do, uh, you know, lay over images over your yourself and graphics and moving things. And you can create a number of tracks. If you have multiple cameras, you can connect them together. And it will work. Uh, as most software, open source software does in, in multiple platforms, even in Windows or Mac, but of course, also in Linux. So in, with OBS Studio, you can record lectures, you can record tracks from multiple audio sources and videos, but you can also uh, use it just for plain streaming. You can have an account on YouTube for, of sorts or, or somewhere else, and you can stream whatever you're doing using OBS. Uh, a great solution as well. So these are are three just very popular, and I see on the chat people are mentioning that, that they use it. I think these are very popular, but many times not well known uh, by people uh, when they have, uh, when people have a lot of prejudice like, around the idea of open source software, free and open source software. They think, well, it's not as good as everything else. But these, these are three that are kind of the standard for quality uh, when we talk about you know, video, audio editing, and uh, uh, streaming. So I really encourage you to try these out, and there are a lot of tutorials online that you can look as well to find uh, these resources. A lot of things that we do, though, are related to creating more uh, complex solutions, uh, co complex resources. And one, one of these solutions to create is, you know, if you want to create um, you know, uh, 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 multimedia content or collections or more complex uh, pages, is a lot of people use something like a blog software like WordPress. But there are other solutions that are really quite interesting and, and uh, rich to explore. And one of them that I think is, is not as well known as it should be is PubPub. And PubPub is a place to publish multimedia content in a very collaborative fashion. It allows for you to do many versions of what you create. You can have discussions over it. It's a great place to create books, for example, if you want to create uh, collaborative books and to publish your books. It's something that people use to create uh, um, uh, journals, for example, but also just a standard uh, content that can be shared with, with other people. Uh, in the case example that I'm giving here, which I thought was kind of cool, it's fermentology on the culture, history, and novelty of fermented things. I love fermented things. Fermented things, I think, are some of the best things that we can eat. So I just kind of got curious about it, and I took a look at this site. And this was created in PubPub. It looks sort of like a blog that you can have content, multimedia content, and the like. But importantly for us, it's an open source solution that's not interested in gathering your your data uh, and, and managing your data and leveraging your data somehow. And you can even install it locally. So if you have your own server, of course, as an open source solution, you can install it yourself. You can just create an account here either for free or by paying if you're going to use it extensively and do this in a very collaborative fashion. So it's a, it's a really great solution to create complex, rich uh, content focused on the idea of collaboration. So I encourage you to try it. 
Another solution that's not very well known, which I really, really enjoy using, is Omeka. And Omeka is, uh, is a digital library software. But you know, a lot of people that want to create collections and want to create, uh, uh, they want to share collections, they have a really hard time because a lot of recommendations are of software. They're incredibly complex. They're institutional softwares like DSpace. And most people are very afraid of using it. Or if they're going to host it, it costs a lot of money. Omeka is one of these solutions that you can install yourself or you can create an account and use it that it's very user-friendly, allows you to create very complex collections and very sophisticated pages with your content, with your open content, uh, without having a lot of knowledge about how this works. And it, it can be very clever and very cool, like this uh, Museum of Refused and Unrealized Art Projects, which I think is a really great idea. Let me reload the page here because it lost some of the images. It's, uh, it, it can be a collection of, of, of images of objects that you have that you can create. You can create exhibitions where you share complex uh, curated uh, content. So you have a, you know, a series of images in your, 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 uh, that you want people to look at in a sequence. Um, you can have just narrative content like this. You can organize your content in a way to present them to people uh, in a way that's, that's more like a digital library. So you can have a lot of assets like videos and audios and files and PDFs and whatever you might want. And you can create rich exhibitions of this. And you can even do things like create uh, 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 um, uh, an exhibition that uses uh, geospatial or time references. So in this case here, this is a Cleveland Historical. It's, uh, it's a site where you can navigate through a map and you can get to some interesting things that you might want to learn more about. And this collection was created uh, using Omeka and you can uh, share it in kind of very rich fashion uh, using all these tools in a fairly easy way. And again, it's open source. You can download it or you can host it uh, in, a, in an Omeka instance, and, and the prices are fairly reasonable. Not only does Omeka itself provide a, a plan, like a $35 a year plan, but you can also find all sorts of other hosting services that do it, or you can you know, create your own server and, and put it up. And it's a really quite of a very simple software to install. But it provides us with a, a really great way to share resources uh, with open licenses where you can actually specify things like you know, rights holder and the licenses that you're using on a free software that you control or that isn't really quite interested, isn't interested at all actually in collecting your, your personal information. And it provides a great place, again, for collaboration. And a lot of people can join in to put their content and, and curate their content and, and so forth. So Omeka is a really, a really interesting place to go for publishing your content somehow. A lot of us are also uh, stuck with things like, you know, when we talk about Google and we talk about Microsoft and we talk about these systems, we're often thinking about things like uh, Office, you know, like uh, uh, Word and Excel and these kinds of systems that we depend on. And so it's become kind of a, a common thing to say, let's just create a Google Doc. Let's just create a Google Doc. It's become part of our language. Uh, and, and that should kind of scare us a bit, like that we, we, uh, we default to a private business to, to, to talk about the things that we're going to do. And we don't use, let's edit a document. We say, let's, let's just do a Google Docs. And a lot of times we think that there are no alternatives, that there's just nothing else to do. And NWU was, I know, had a, I don't know if it's still alive, but it's a project with, uh, with running uh, only office for the, the faculty. And so you might already, if you're from NWU, you have a, a perspective on this, but only office is, a, is a, an excellent alternative to using proprietary solutions like Google. Uh, a lot of people don't have the, the understanding or the scope of what happens with, with their multiple images and photographs and all the content that we put in these platforms. And over time, the amount of stuff that you put in, how difficult it is for you to migrate, not because you can't download your data, but because it's just too much trouble and you end up being... Uh, feeding these these uh, these uh, uh, businesses your content and your behavior in these platforms in a way that you become dependent on them and they can track this behavior over time. And as we encourage students to do that as well, we're kind of build bringing them into the same ecosystems. And so looking for alternatives is a really uh, intelligent uh, proposition. Only Office is one of these. And you can create a personal account in personal personal.onlyoffice.com and you can have an institutional solution and you can even you know pay for an account which is really not quite expensive uh, and you can uh, create documents as you would in any other platform presentations and so forth but again uh, only office is really not that interested in collecting private information and it's an open source solution that you can host yourself if you'd like so there are alternatives to this 
Another alternative, and I'll present this because I think it's important to say, is when we're talking about open source software and open source solutions, uh, there's there's also an interest in thinking, uh, uh, if we're thinking about privacy, it's, it's about leveraging these solutions that don't necessarily work on the, uh, on the open space, but are very attuned to your privacy. And one of these these solutions that I, I kind of admire is, is, is Zoho, which has been around for a very long time, and a lot of people also don't know it, which is a suite of, of products that is very clear in their proposition. Um, Zoho is, is clear in their terms of, of service that they are not interested in collecting personal data. They are interested in providing some services for free so that you can pay for their services uh, and join in uh, uh, their, their multiple offerings. So as, even though it's not an open source solution, it's not a, a free and open source solution, uh, it's already, I think, a step up from what we normally do using the simply free solutions uh, because they have very clear terms in, in, in their terms of service that say they're not interested in collecting private information and your personal information as you're using their services. So only office an open source, a free and open source solution, Zoho, one that is not, but at least is attentive and very clear in their terms uh, uh, in, in regards to using, uh, not using your data for their, their purposes. It's just, it's, it's a commercial platform. You want their service, you pay for it, and that's it. Very clear as it used to be, makes a lot of sense. So I like to present this as an, as an offshoot solution so that we can, we can look at the, the, the tensions that exist between selecting uh, both open source and private and putting these two things together is of course our goal, but sometimes when, when that's not possible, other solutions arise that are still better than the, the generally free gratis solutions that we get from these other uh, companies. Another very exciting thing to use is uh, uh, Etherpad. And Etherpad has a lot of instances that are open. I'll share with you the one that we normally uh, use, uh, but that's going to be going down in, in, in very shortly. Let me share another one uh, that you can use. You know, Rise Up is a good solution. So there are many of these instances installed in, in many places. And you basically, a pad is something that you can create with whatever name you'd like. So I'm going to do uh, lecture sounds bad. NWU talk, I'm going to give it a name. And if you've never used an Etherpad before, it's quite a cool experience for you to use. Uh, Etherpad is just a document that you can, let me share this with you so you can try if you want to join now. Uh, Etherpad is just kind of a cool place you can join in to edit things uh, with hundreds of people if you want, dozens of people. Uh, you can identify yourself here with a color or a name if you want. If you join that link, you'll, I'll see you joining here. And somebody just joined. That's cool. Name, if you want, you can put here. And we can just kind of join in and, and edit this document together. And if more people join in, uh, we could probably do, as I did once when, when a talk like this, we did a, a list of, of all these softwares we put here together and we, we edit the document together. We can have lecture notes. So if we're all watching the same lecture, we can lecture, uh, do this together. If we want students to just write like a, a summary of, a, of a, a, an article they read, instead of everybody doing the summary of the article, we can say, why don't you all just join together and, and come here and we can write the summary together. If we're thinking about collaboration and creating useful products and sharing this with people, uh, an Etherpad is a really great way to create a temporary document for 60 days or, or longer if you want, where people just kind of join in and they create some content and everybody has access to it. It's open, everybody can see it, everybody can edit it, uh, and it's something that we can do collaboratively. So while this is rolling on, I'll just show you an example of what we do with these pads. And we do, we use them a lot. And this is a course where we had about uh, 80 students joining in and they were planning their projects and groups in this Etherpad. And one of the things that Etherpads allows you to do, which is really quite, quite cool, is that you think, well, this is an open collaborative document that anybody can come in and and edit what what happens when you have so many people and you you know somebody can in and, and edit the document and delete everything and so one of the things that etherpad does is that it allows you to save multiple versions of the document uh, <coughs> as you oh wait let me go to the beginning here it allows you to save all the versions of the document as you're going around uh, as you're going over time and you can see the versions of the documents that you're using wait just because i said so this one isn't I have to refresh the screen. You can see it over time and you can go back. So if somebody makes a mistake, somebody does something that they shouldn't do in the pad for some reason. Uh, let me open another one. This is giving me a headache. 
wait a second. You can go back and you can see different versions and you can uh, always, uh, uh, ooh, you can always go away. Uh, you can always go back and um, and uh, change uh, if somebody made a mistake. So it, you know, it, it's a really comforting kind of space where you can go back and say, everybody can edit. You're not going to lose anything. If something goes wrong, we can go back and get a different version and everybody can see what's happening. Uh, and uh, it's, it's no big deal if we lose something. I'm trying to do it here for some reason, just because I want to demo it, it's not showing. But you'll have to believe me and you can try it later. And I think it's because I'm using Zoom on the same browser. It's kind of heavy. But you can, you can see these things change over time and you can share this uh, with, with students and tell them it's kind of a safe place for you to, uh, to, to edit things uh, and create these documents. And eventually you can take it out and put it somewhere else and put it in a formatted space if you want. But you can just use it collaboratively with dozens and hundreds of people if you like. So sorry that the, the time slider didn't work, but maybe it'll work right here. Let's see if this one will work now that we have something. Let's go back in time. Oh, there we go. That will work. And so we have all these versions. We have about, what, probably 100 versions saved. And it can go over time and see everything that's happening. And we can go back and find content that was deleted if for some reason it was deleted. So there we go. The demo didn't go to didn't go to trash. Etherpad and Framapad are the same thing. Framapad is based on Etherpad. So it's the same, the same thing. And it's another, just another instance. You can find many. Rise Up has one. We installed one. There are a lot of, you know, there are, I think, dozens of places where you can find Etherpads. And since they're, they're made to be ephemeral, they're not something that, you know, takes a lot of space. And they're made to last, you know, 60 days, 180 days. Uh, you, you, can, you can use pretty much anywhere and, and uh, anywhere will work. Um, so it's very easy to find a pad that you can use. And Framapad is a really great example. Another place that we can, that a lot of people use, uh, but, sorry, I had a glass of water here. Uh, a lot of people use the Wikipedia, but they don't know they have a space that they can edit and, and work as, as a, an educational community is the Wikiversity. And Wikiversity is, is very different from, from Wikipedia in the sense that Wikipedia has a lot of, 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 uh, of uh, standards they have to follow. And even though anybody can edit, anybody can come in and change the content, uh, you will find that if you try to edit Wikipedia, you'll you'll go through a number of people that are moderating the content and seeing changes and not only humans, but bots as well. And it's meant to be as a reference. So there's a lot of caution into what goes in and a lot of supervision as to what goes in, in Wikipedia. Wikiversity, on the other hand, is a place where you can join in and, and create your, your page for your community of students or, or your lab or whatever it might be to use the experience of working collaborative on, collaboratively on a wiki, but doing it in, in a kind of a, a place where nobody's going to mediate and change your content. So you can create your own space and edit and modify and do it collaboratively without thinking of it as a, as a, you know, a reference space like Wikipedia. So this is the place where, where we work. It's called Educação Aberta, which is open education. And this is the page that I use, and it's going to come with a, a weird link because of all the the little letters that we use in Portuguese. But Educação Aberta is something where I publish and I work with my students with providing a bunch of information on uh, open science and what open is and distance education. And students do analysis of, of platforms like, like Google and Facebook, like uh, the, the, the topics that I was discussing here. They create infographics, they post it online, just like they would do on a Wikipedia page. And this becomes something that's available to everybody. It's available for people to use. It has, as you will see in the bottom, just like Wikipedia, an open license. So this content that cre is created by students over time is content that's available for anybody to use within the idea of an open license, of an, an open educational resource. And the cool thing of this, as it is in Wikipedia, is that I can show students that over time people have come in and made modifications and they've collaborated with a bunch of people to make this happen. So you can see that there are a number of students that have collaborated over this document until, say, July 2019, but you will also see, let me get another one here, uh, that I started this, this YouTube analysis by students so they could understand what does YouTube work, how does it, how does it make money, what is it, what is it about, and I started that, say it was, what, 2019 in June, and just this semester, some students started picking up to make some additions to it two years later. And I'm, I have other examples where this has happened more over time, but the idea is that students 
come in and they modify and they change and they participate in this sort of community and they don't look at their resources as something that's finished and done and over with, but they look at it as, as something that they're going to produce now and that it's going to be modified and changed over time by other people. It's going to be kind of a living document that people are going to be able to, to change and see in the future and be part of this community of creators. It's not that they don't have attribution, the attribution is here in the history, but that they don't take possession of this as something that's theirs. They think of, of a product that's visible to other people that other people can use in the future. And there's, there's a bunch of stuff like you know tutorials that in, in video that people have created and transcriptions of videos and all sorts of other materials that generally would be just kind of stuck with students and teachers in a closed environment that have no reason to be stuck. They, they could be open, they could be available and other people might make use of it. And that, that idea of, 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 uh, of sharing this openly with other people kind of changes the idea of how students look at the, the materials that they produce. This idea that whatever they produce is something that's closed and not available to everybody else. And I'll give you another example, which I think is, is kind of cool, is that uh, I mentioned that we used Etherpad to create these, these uh, summaries of articles. And so this professor, Cesar Madeo, created a book that's called, uh, that, that talks about open source software and free software. And I asked my students to get together. Instead of each one of them giving me a summary of what they read, I said, why don't you just create together in, in, in groups of you know, two or three students, everyone will write a summary of the chapter. And so we have this really cool summary made by students over a couple of years. And uh, I pinged the teacher, uh, the, the, the author of the book, Sesha, and I said, would you mind just kind of taking a look at it and, and giving us a you're okay and, and letting us know that this was something that, 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 uh, that is, is something that you like uh, or not and give us some of your feedback. And he wrote a little, he did a little video commentary and I published it here for the students. All of this is open, open, openly licensed, of course. And so the students create something that's available to everybody. I can use this as an, uh, an educational resource in my future classes. The author gets to know that the students did something that's available that, that he, even he can share. Everybody wins because it's openly licensed. And I don't know if this was ever used by other people, but it might be uh, in the future. I certainly use it with my own students. And you can, of course, like a, a, a Wikipedia document, you can just get in and edit if you want. Um, even without uh, uh, registration. Uh, and it becomes a really cool space to, to collect this sort of memory of all these courses that, that you're, you're doing and the students to see their production uh, publicly. So I encourage you to take a look at that as well. If you're looking for a more structured space now, I know a lot of us are in, in institutions uh, and we, we have our own spaces to publish our courses, but a lot of times you want, uh, people want a, a recommendations of where can they publish their courses. One, one cool space to do that with fairly easy, uh, a fairly smooth introduction is Open Learn Create. And Open Learn Create is created by uh, the Open University in the UK, and it provides a, a Moodle space that's fairly customized where you can put up your content and create your own course. Or you can find other courses that you can use as well from other people that have created. And we've we've used it as, as part of the Open Education for a Better World program. We've uh, we've used this uh, in the past, and some people have created uh, one of one of the courses that I really enjoy is is this playwriting for children uh, course. And uh, Dr. Arjuna Shavana was his mentor in the in the in the in the Open Education for a Better World program. He didn't need mentorship. He needed just help getting this online. And he created this very fascinating course based on decades of experience he has on, on playwriting for children and with children participating in creating this course. And he created a, a basic course online without having any idea of how to do this using Open Learn Create. And of course, all the content can be licensed openly and other people can find it and use it uh, and share this content for other people to use. It's a really great place to, 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 to show how an open source software like Moodle uh, can be leveraged to create an open space for people to share open content uh, beyond just the idea of free, but openly licensed as well. So Open Learn Create is a good recommendation. If you're not institutional, you don't have a place to create your courses, this is a great place to explore. Now, finally, I want to talk about two things like uh, that are that I think are really important is you know, where you can share your resources. And a lot of times we share our resources in places that are, are standard in our mindset. Like uh, we put video on YouTube, we put uh, documents on a Google Drive or a Dropbox and, and so forth. And I wanted you to uh, I wanted to share at least a couple of places which I think are really great for you to explore uh, that are open source software as well, free and open source. And one of them, if you've never used, is Nextcloud. 
And xCloud is, is, is the software itself. And there are many instances that, that provide hosting for nextcloud which you can of course again have some space for free but if you want you can pay for it for very reasonable prices to share your content so instead of putting your images on in your files and your documents on on a you know, on google cloud where you you have you know you're serving them free content for them to analyze you can have your own private space where you can control your content and again i know nw had in the, in the past some relationship with uh, with an uh, nextcloud project but for those of you that are not at nw it's a really great uh, solution to explore. And one of the places you can get an account for, for free to start out with if you want to explore is the good cloud, and there are many others. And as you can see in the beginning, this is not something that you would see at Google, is your privacy is important. Uh, and the idea that you can share, sync, and, 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 and provide content to others while having privacy is incredibly important to these platforms. And NextCloud is an open source software that, again, you can host yourself if you want. But uh, it might just be easier to pay a small fee, monthly fee, for somebody to do it for you. And these services are, uh, you know, they include Document Entity with only Office or Collabora, which is another solution. They include sharing photos and sharing folders and everything else you would see uh, in, in Google Drive, for example. So it's, it's a great alternative to these solutions that are, uh, that are, uh, that are used institutionally in many different places. This is, this is not like a second rate solution. This is uh, a standard solution for, for productivity and sharing. And finally, one that uh, again, many people know for other reasons is archive.org. So if you wanna host your videos, your podcasts, your PDFs, your documents, your books, archive.org is, is very well known for the Wayback Machine. So people, if, want, if they wanna see the internet, how the internet was a long time ago, they go to the Wayback Machine and they, they enter something like yahoo.com to see how Yahoo was was uh, years ago. Wayback Machine is kind of a, a cool thing, but uh, the Internet Archive is is an open source based software or a system that is a nonprofit that hosts a ton of content. And you can create your own account and host your own content there as well. So instead of putting, for example, your podcast on a proprietary system or uh, your video on YouTube, you can host it on, on uh, Internet Archive. And you can donate, as I've done in the past. You can donate to them to help support them. So in our podcast here, uh, and this will be in Portuguese, so it won't be particularly interesting to you, but we have a little page where we host our podcasts and uh, an audio files for things that we do and documents and so forth. Uh, and the Internet Archive allows you to host this, this content using an open license and in multiple open formats that people can download. Uh, so you can download it. It converts automatically to a, a number of different formats. It uses by default the options of open licenses, and you can share this content openly without having to resort to proprietary platforms. There are many, many others, and I will share finally with you a link from the last time I did this talk. We ended up using an Etherpad, and you're welcome to contribute to it. It was part of the Open Education for a Better World program. It was a little bit different than this talk, but uh, I, I shared a bunch of ideas, and then a bunch of other people got in on the Etherpad and added a bunch more. Uh, our own uh, free choice site has a bunch more as well, but here you can have an idea of the scope of the kinds of things that you can do and the things that you can create using uh, open source uh, and free software solutions. So I encourage you to take a look. If you have any more that you'd like to suggest that are not just free, but free and open, uh, please do. Uh, this is a growing list and eventually I hope we can kind of publish it as an, as an open solution as well. Uh, and you can find all the links that I mentioned there and, and many, many more that you can explore. So I've reached about the hour of my time. I wanted to thank again, again for the opportunity and I'll stay here for any conversations that we might have. Thanks again.